Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, I hope you are fine and have understood the previous lecture related to introduction to instrumentation and measurements. We talked about the scope and extent of this course in addition to giving a try to develop our understanding about instrumentation and measurement by relating things to the real life. If you can remember, in the previous video, I announced that I'll be talking about measurement systems first and then in the later half of the course, I'll shift my focus towards instruments. Therefore, in this particular lecture, I'm going to lay down some basic concepts, terminologies, and categories necessary for understanding the measurement systems. Furthermore, it is recommended that you take these introductory lectures seriously because we are going to use these concepts developed over here in the later part of the course. So let's go. Before discussing in-depth details of any system or instrument, it is of prime importance that we know what kind of instruments or systems we may encounter and what are the characteristics of a particular type of a system. Therefore, let's talk about categories into which instruments are broadly categorized. Each category will dictate us to use that instrument in a specific kind of situation and with defined type of measurement systems only. So the first categorization which I'm going to talk about is whether an instrument is an active instrument or a passive instrument. As the name suggests, passive instruments are timid, shy, and are unable to perform the task on their own. They require a push from the outside, just like your passive friend who doesn't talk that much, doesn't participate, or contribute to activities happening around him. And if you want him to do something, then you have to provide the push or the energy. And as soon as that energy diminishes, your friend will become inactive once again. Similarly, a passive instrument requires energy from the outside, which they will consume with performing the task. As soon as the external energy depletes, the instrument stops working. Most often, the energy consumed by the passive instrument is the same energy which it is trying to measure. For example, a mercury in glass thermometer is a passive instrument that absorbs heat energy from the environment to detect the temperature. Hence, the absorbed energy is directly being used for the measurement. You should have this question in your mind that if a passive instrument is working by absorbing the energy of the environment, then it is affecting the environment and hence the overall measurement process. So the answer to this query is yes. And this thing is called loading of the system because the instrument is absorbing the energy of the system and hence acting as a load for the system. On the contrary, the active instruments are energetic, dynamic, and can perform tasks on their own. You can compare these instruments to your active friends. Your active friend is always doing something and doesn't need a push to perform a task. He generates the required energy from within and requires only an input from the outside world about how to do something. Similarly, active instruments have their own energy source and require only a stimulus from the outside world. They will do the rest of the job on their own. For example, a digital IR thermometer used by the staff of any mall to check your body temperature when you are entering that mall is an active device. It only uses small amount of input in form of IR radiations emitted by your body and somehow without loading the system convert received IR radiations into your body temperature. Whatever energy is required for the conversion and display of the temperature information, it is coming from within the device. The image shown over here is a schematic of another passive pressure measuring instrument. You can see that whatever pressure this fluid has will exert some force on the piston. This force will cause the piston to move against the spring and hence the pointer will move. This movement may easily be calibrated to show the pressure of the fluid. In this device, the pressure energy of the fluid is being converted to the kinetic energy of the pointer. Therefore, this instrument is using system's energy to measure the pressure. Hence, this is a passive device. 
However, the image shown over here is a schematic of an active instrument. Although still the height of the float is directly affected by the volume of the fluid present in the container, but this change in height is converted into the resistance change of the attached variable resistor and hence the voltage drop across the variable resistor is now signifying the height of the float or it is representing the height of the float. This device is using a stimulus from the system and then it is using its own energy source to convert and display that stimulus into another suitable form. Over here, I would ask you to think of any passive and active instrument which you have used in your daily life and write it in the comments below. Make sure you write something you have used and not some boring instrument mentioned in your book or anywhere on the internet. As far as the utility of both kind of instruments is concerned, passive instruments are normally simpler in construction and have much lower resolution as compared to active ones. Therefore, they are normally cheaper as well. However, active instruments involve much more complex construction. Normally, the electronics is there, which gives these instruments much higher resolution, making them quite expensive. Another way in which we can categorize instruments is whether the instrument shows the measured value through some deflection or that measurement is shown by some zero reading or null reading. For example, the passive pressure measuring instrument, mercury in glass thermometer, and even the IR thermometer are examples of deflection type instruments because they show some deflection in their output, which is directly proportional to the measured value. So are there any instruments that doesn't show any deflection? And if yes, then how they are used to measure something? You must have seen the weight balance used by a fruit seller to measure the fruit or to weigh the fruit. He plays a specific weight on one side and adds the fruit to the other side. Unless both sides are balanced and the instrument shows zero deflection. At this point, you will say that the weight of the fruit is equal to the weight of the standard mass placed on the other side. Moreover, this schematic shows an instrument used to measure the unknown voltage source. In this instrument, the slide wire will have a specific resistance and setting off the variable resistor will allow a known voltage to be dropped across the slide wire. If both contacts A and B are at the zero mark, then there will be no potential difference between them. However, as contact B moves away, a certain potential difference will exist between A and B. If contact B reaches the other end of the slide wire, then maximum potential difference will exist between A and B. Now let's suppose an unknown voltage source is attached between contacts A and B, but in opposite direction. If the potential difference between A and B is equal to the voltage of the unknown source, there will be no current flowing through this unknown source. Otherwise, the galvanometer will show some non-zero output. So the aim is to move contact B to a location where the potential difference between A and B becomes equal to the voltage of the unknown voltage source and galvanometer shows a null reading or a zero reading. At this point, the value of voltage source will be equal to the potential difference between contact A and B. Another example of null type instrument is a pressure measuring instrument shown in this schematic. The pressure of the fluid will raise the platform above the datum point. Therefore, downward force is applied on the piston by placing some weights on it. If the downward force applied by the weights become equal to the force applied on the piston by the pressurized fluid, then the piston will be at datum point. At this moment, the amount of weight will be directly proportional to the pressure of the fluid. Normally, null type instruments are much more accurate than deflection type instruments and therefore are used for calibration purposes. Note that deflection type instruments are easier to use and therefore are installed at suitable locations in any factory floor 
whereas null type instruments are cumbersome to use and therefore are seldom used on the factory floor. The next characteristic through which we can categorize instruments is the type of output that instrument can generate. And by type, I mean whether it is generating an analog signal or a digital signal. Without going into the details of what analog and digital mean, I can safely say that analog instruments produce continuous output as the input changes, whereas digital instruments produce discretized output as the input changes. Simple example to clarify my point can be of a bathroom scale. This scale will show discrete output that is 97.9 98.0, 98.1, and so on. Whereas this wing scale has a continuous pointer that can show any value on the scale. However, our inability to read values beyond certain decimal places doesn't make the device digital. Similarly, the shown digital clock can show the time nearest to a second, that is, 36 seconds, then 35 seconds, or oh sorry, 37 seconds, and so on. Whereas the pointer on the analog clock will move all the infinite points between 36 seconds and 37 seconds mark, hence producing a continuous output. Once again, it is our inability that we cannot see or observe the needle when it was at 36.3454344 seconds, for example, or in finite other locations. Another example of a digital instrument is shown by this schematic. You should be able to appreciate that as soon as the shown cam moves away from the shown position, the pull-up spring will break the contact inside the switch. And when the cam will return to the shown position, the contact will be made once again. So for every one rotation, the contact will be made once and hence whenever the contact is made, the counter will increment its count by one. Therefore, this instrument can measure the number of rotations the cam is making. Note that although the cam is moving continuously, the output will increment in discrete steps only. That is one rotation, two rotations, three rotations and so on. Therefore, this is a digital instrument. The technological advancements that we talked about in the previous lecture has allowed us to use digital controllers and microprocessors quite extensively. The inclusion of such digital components has motivated the use of digital instruments instead of analog ones. So what should we do with the analog instruments which we have developed since 4000 BC, for example? As we transition from analog instrumentation to digital instrumentation, digital versions of all type of sensors are still not available. Moreover, some quantities are easier to measure in analog domain than in digital. So instead of discarding all analog instruments, we found a trick to convert their output into a digital form. This trick is achieved by an analog to digital conversion. However, we have to pay a price for this conversion in form of loss of information. Let me try to clarify this point through an illustration. Suppose I ask three students of your class to record the temperature of a certain room continuously for two hours using a thermometer. Additionally, I ask you to present me the continuous temperature in form of a graph. As humans, you cannot record temperature at each and every instant. So this is what three students did. One of them was obedient enough. So he stood in the room for two hours and recorded temperature after every minute. The graph he came up would have 120 points in it. One point for every minute and he can join these points with a continuous line to make a continuous graph. So maybe this was something what he got. And this was the graph that he got after joining these 120 points. The second student didn't want to spend two hours in the room. So what he did, he visited the room after every 10 minutes and recorded the temperature. He got 12 points like these, for example, this one and this one, over here, over here, 
and then maybe over here, over here, and so on. When he joined these points with a curve, he got something like this. The last student was a prince. So he went out with the friends and came back after every half hour to take the temperature reading. So at the end, he only had four points. And when he plotted and joined these four points, this is something which he got. So joining these four points with straight line or a curve gave us something like this. Now you can see what happened. Suppose that the first student data is continuous, so it contains information about every minute, whereas some information is missing from the graph of the second student. And for the third, a huge amount of information has been lost. This is a drawback of converting an analog signal into a digital one. However, for recording analog signal, the student has to spend two complete hours, that is, he had to put too much effort. So at one side there is information and on the other side there is effort. Can we find a balance between the two? An answer to this is obviously a yes. I won't go into the details now because that will be out of the scope of this lecture. So we will touch on this topic once again in some later lecture. After this I like to talk about a category that differentiates sensors based on the way they present their output indicating instruments and instruments with signal out. By the name, you could have guessed that an indicating instrument will present its output in form of some indication. This indication will be visual or audio, and furthermore, the magnitude of the indication is sometimes directly proportional to the physical quantity that is being measured. On the other hand, instruments with signal output are those who generate some sort of electrical signal as a measure of the physical quantity. Now you must be wondering where both type of instruments are used. Well, indicating instruments are normally used where an output is required by a human observer. For example, a bathroom scale will produce a movement of pointer indicating your weight or if digital, then some number representing your weight. Similarly, an engineer passing down the factory floor wants to know the temperatures and pressures of the lines carrying a certain fluid. For that, they have installed temperature and pressure sensors on the floor which are measuring and directly displaying the required quantity. Furthermore, almost all null type and passive instruments are indicating type. You must have guessed the drawback of such instruments by now. Yes, they require human observer to read the value. On the contrary, instruments with signal output generates a signal proportional to the measured physical quantity. This signal is fed directly to a controller which is responsible for maintaining the system automatically. Sometimes humans have installed indicating instruments on the signal wire to convert the signal into the measured quantity so that they can troubleshoot the automatic control system. An example of these type of instrument is a temperature sensor installed in the AC at your home. You have no idea of the temperature that sensor is measuring because it is generating an electrical signal proportional to the temperature it is sensing. This signal is fed to the controller of the AC that controls the working of the compressor to maintain set temperature in your room. The last way of categorization I will like to quickly skim through is whether the instrument is a smart instrument or not. In these modern days, smart sensors are popping up in every domain. But truly, which sensor is regarded as a smart sensor? Well, according to Tom Griffiths, product manager at Honeywell Industrial Measurement, a smart sensor has at least three features in it. Firstly, it should be a microprocessor driven sensor. So all passive sensors are out of the race. Secondly, it should have communication capabilities for transmitting its signal to some control or monitoring system. And thirdly, it should have some form of onboard diagnostic that allow it to reduce maintenance costs and increase operational accuracy. Therefore, any measuring system incorporating these features may be regarded as a smart sensor or 
a smart measuring system. Keep in mind that a sensor that only sends its data to some remote location is not a smart sensor. With this, I would like to bid you all goodbye with the hope that you have understood how sensors can be categorized and what each categorization means. Moreover, I hope you now can categorize any sensor into one of the category we have discussed in this lecture. Thank you and take care.